Hello, everyone. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started with the ACCSP Coordinating Council. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so to start the meeting, the first order of business is to approve the agenda um, in the interest of time and also uh, in the interest of a of an item that's come to our attention, um, I would like to entertain a motion to modify the agenda. Shuri. Yes, uh, thank you. So again, to address our time constraints today, I move to modify the agenda to add, after agenda item five, public comment, a discussion pertaining to maintenance project funding then proceed to agenda item nine, review and consider approval of 2020 RFPs, and then follow the agenda as written and stop the meeting at any of the agenda updates, um, either agenda seven or eight, um, if time does not allow for the updates. Great, thank you. Do I have a second? D. Is there any objection to this motion? Seeing none, we shall proceed. Okay, and next is you all have uh, meeting minutes from the winter meeting in your packets. Is there any, any comment or editing needed to those meeting minutes? Great, seeing none. And finally, is there anybody in the public who would like to provide comment? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to what is now our first agenda item. Uh, so this uh, item uh, concerns the um, formula that we're using for maintenance projects uh, where the projects, a project is funded for four years and then after that there begins a 33% step down each year for three years until funding reaches zero. Um, so we had uh, this come up at the executive um, committee that some states are, um, are going to be put in a difficult position with this. And I wanted to, at this point, Pat, if it's okay, um, tee you up to talk a little bit about this. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, the, the state of Maine in planning for the, the reduction in maintenance funds of 33% uh, a year uh, step down that has been outlined back from 2016. Um, we were in the process of putting together uh, outlines for new new proposals as it pertains to, in particular, lobster reporting, uh, and um, we are fully prepared to submit uh, new applications for, for that use. And in fact, we, uh, since Mr. McKernan's here, will highlight the fact that we are intending to hopefully go in that direction for uh, the year 2020, Dan. Um, Okay, you win. I give. <laughs> um, so the, the, what we also, though, have started to look at, um, at pertaining to not only uh, Massachusetts but New Hampshire and states as far down as New Jersey are, is a multi-state effort that we run out of the state of Maine for monitoring the herring fishery. Um, reductions in that line at this time become problematic and it relates to what's going on in Massachusetts as well because of their reliance on uh, research set aside for that and the money that comes in through research set aside. So there's some complexity there with these multi-state uh, approaches. And so one of the ways to potentially resolve this um, if, if I may, would be to modify the RFP as one way to address this. Instead of having it be a hard, um, you will reduce by 33%, um, softer language to say you would reduce by up to 33% uh, to give the, this coordinating council some uh, additional flexibility when it comes time to addressing those type of multi-state uh, proposals. Okay, um, thank you, Pat. So uh, the question is, is there any, um, I'm not sure if we need a motion for this or not. So the idea here is to uh, amend the RFP with just a single word um, that would allow some flexibility uh, for the coordinating council 
Uh, so that, that, and that step down is up to 33%. So there's a couple of scenarios where this might not be a bad idea. Um, but I think there's also, I, I wanna extend the conversation a little further, but first, does anybody have any objection to modifying the RFP in this way, or does anybody have any comments about this? Sherry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, have been involved in this maintenance uh, process from, from the beginning, and I was on that work group that uh, came into this step process of reducing state's um, reliance on ACCSP funding. With what Pat is suggesting, I don't have much of an opposition to at this point in time. As long as it just pertains to those projects or those proposals that are multi-state faceted, um, I understand that we probably should have gotten together well before now to have these discussions with these multi-state projects. and. Therefore, I'm willing to concede that on this particular RFP, but I'm not willing to necessarily concede this on a state basis, a state project basis, just on those that are multi-state faceted. Thank you, Sheree. Does anybody else have any comments about this? And then if not, I'll try to sum up. D. I I would endorse what Cherie said, um, I very much, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the states who would like to see the step down start. So if we restrict this only to the multi-state proposals, um, I'm fine with that for one year until that um, can be revisited later this year, maybe for next year. Um, I think we may need to define the multi-state proposals because some partners think they're in a multi-state proposal they're, you know, I've ranked these proposals. I see how people kind of play the game, to be quite honest. Um, and there are a handful what I would consider truly multi-state proposals. So I, so. So thank you, Dee. So I, I, I think one of the things that might, be, oh, Bob. Just, just to add to the comments, you know, I, I'm kind of torn. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of like an ACCSP purist. I get the notion that you know, the funding through ACCSP is meant for pilot type programs and then once they're up and running and you get over that, that initial hurdle of some um, initial startup cost, then the state or a different agency takes it over after that. But <clears throat> here's where I'm torn is that, you know, I see kind of the fiscal reality that some of the states are in and some of these maintenance projects, if we end up with holes in those data streams or you know, diminished sampling levels. I think it's gonna it's gonna cause some problems downstream, especially you know one of the projects that that Pat uh, or that Maine gets money for is the herring sampling project. And if you're around this morning, uh, which seems like about 30 hours ago, um, you know it, there <clears throat> the herring quotas are way down. The herring stocks in rough shape, and and you know reduced biological sampling in that fishery is really you know that's something we want to avoid. So I'm kind of torn on this, but I think a, a couple other pieces of information is that. You know, I don't have a good sense of how many more proposals and how many more viable proposals we're going to get if we start diminishing funding to the maintenance project. So, um, you know, if we end up with not getting a whole lot of additional projects or proposals, then we end up with kind of quote unquote extra money at the end of this process. I would hate to see funding to a state project be diminished um, just either by funding a pilot program that's really not that great of a project or you know, just having money sit on the table because we, we've obligated ourselves to go down 33% and we don't have any other proposals that have come in. Um, the other piece of information is that it looks like the total funding for ACCSP may be increased a little bit for this year. We may go up from, if the Atlantic Coastal Act part of that may go up by about 75,000. So we may have an extra few dollars in, at the end of the pipeline. So put all those ram, random thoughts together and I think I, you know, I'm comfortable with where, where Pat is going with this. And I, and I get the multi-state dimension that, that Dee and, and Sharia brought up as well. Yeah, thanks, Bob. That's helpful. Robert, is that your hand? Yep. Yes, ma'am. This is about like a conversation about Social Security. 
I'm a state that's benefited. Our state has benefited terrifically by a maintenance project. I'm grateful for that. I just want the coordinating council to recognize we made a policy decision about this maintenance and pilot project. Very difficult conversation. Um, a very courageous decision, I believe, uh, at the time. And um, I say that with the group recognizing it's, it's our ox that's being gored here a little bit. So I just want us to think about this. I think uh, Vice Chairman Keller puts a, a really good point out there. There are priority things that we need to do and we need to be able to allocate resources to. Uh, and that is certainly within the prerogative of, of this group. Um, but I just remind you, we made a, a difficult and a courageous decision several years ago about stepping down, and um, I think it's important that we, we honor that commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. It, it, it's a fair point, and I think we also have to be cognizant that once you begin, um, you know, it's likely that we would need some sort of criteria because if we are if if we are deciding that one maintenance project gets a buy, then the next maintenance project asks, and the next, and the next. So it is a uh, something that we have to be very cognizant, and the the process that got us where we are today. So given what we've heard, a couple of things. I I would. A, I think we're going to need a motion if we want to amend the RFP. So I would ask that somebody make a motion if we want to add that up to 33%. But the way that I would see this unfolding is that we would, if we were to amend the RFP, that we would let the proposals come in and let the operations committee review them and see where we fall out. And at that point, I think two things should happen. I think the operations committee might want to take the opportunity just to do a little cross check on our priorities. And I think also we should consider convening uh, some uh, variant of that work group that convened years ago to develop this process. So the coordinating council and the operations committee to discuss exactly how we would deal with these multi-state uh, projects that might um, that might that might ask for a step down. Um, a step down waiver, if you will. I think it's going to be really important to get that group together, talk about, as Dee said, what is a multi-partner project, um, and come up with some criteria as to how exactly that that would happen. But I think initially the first step would be, is there anybody um, who would uh, like to make a motion to amend Pat? Look, it's already there. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would move to amend the RFP to read up to 33% for multi-agency proposals only for FY 2020. And if I get a second, I'll add some additional rationale. Dan, thank you. Um, so um, whenever Robert Boyle speaks and he pauses, it makes me nervous because I expect a quote to come. So thank God he stopped at just Social Security. Um, he, he was looking for one, I think. Um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't take this lightly. Uh, I know there was a lot of, uh, as he put it, a courageous policy decision on this um, point. And what I'm, I'm not looking for anything guaranteed here. It is strictly to allow some, for some flexibility um, between the ops committee and, and ultimately the coordinating council to make uh, decisions on, uh, on areas of high priority. Any other comments? Uh, Kathy. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. As a person who sat on ops for about 18 years and sat on, I think, every single funding work group that has ever been um, and will ever be and has aged me in dog years, um, we knew that 
the rubber was going to hit the road for this exact thing, and it was probably going to be one of the maintenance proposals that had been going for 15, 18, almost 20 years in terms of data collection. And I can remember sitting on the work group, um, the most recent one that's been referenced when we put forward this phase-in plan, and we had the opportunity for partners who had been receiving the funds for so many years to be on that, and them saying, we need the structured timeline to take this to our legislators and our representatives in order to have the time to make a plan and work with um, legal changes that need to be made. So I understand that there are perhaps some more unexpected bumps that have come up when it's multi-agency. However, I would recommend that the I'm not sure I'm comfortable with actually changing the RFP and saying up to. I think I'm a little bit more comfortable with a group of partners who want to pursue that, putting that in their cover letter and giving us the reasons why this needs to be considered and it's imperative. And then the operations committee and the advisors taking that under um, advisement for their recommendations because you all would need to decide right now which proposals that applies to and why does it does it apply to the headboat proposal um, those are our partners in the South Atlantic are very concerned that um, are my partner right here to the right in Florida doesn't have that I know of yet set aside money for the headboat sampling once this funding source runs out I don't know what their plans are but they've had time to work on it and so I think we need to be very very careful and I would not be in support of changing the RFP at this point. I would suggest that the partners get together and supply strong language in their cover letter that indicates to them why this is necessary and let the ops and advisors use that as part of their review. Thank you. Thank you. Are, th are there any other comments on the motion at this point? So, uh, Kathy, or, or maybe uh, Mike or Bob, you can help me. So if, if this motion were to not pass and the partners were to include language in their cover letter, does the operations committee, do we, does the coordinating council even have the ability to, if they do? Okay. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So the answer there is that yes, if, if this RFP is not amended, it sounds like that flexibility still remains if a compelling case is, is given in a, in a cover letter from the partner. So at that point, um, I guess what I'm gonna do is just call the question on this um, so that if you... I did, yeah. So uh, I'll read the motion. It's moved to amend the RFP to read up to 33% for multi-agency proposals only for FY20. So if you are in favor, please signify. Any abstentions? <laughs> Any nulls? And I'm hesitating because I thought I saw uh, Mr. Langley's hand up in opposition for, Mar for Maryland and Mr. Dyes in. Um, mm. So maybe you're a null. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would like for. Okay. It sounds like the motion carries 11 7 3. And I'm hoping I got that right. Okay, is there any other comments on this or we'll move on? Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would um, like to make a motion that we convene a work group to have this discussion to iron out these devil in the details um, so that there is no future to these motions. Fair enough. Second by Matt Graves. Any comments on the motion? How would you want that group composed, Cherie? If we can find out who were previous work group members, um, get, them, get them together. If they are not present, then we just need a combination of ops and coordinating council individuals. Okay, so the motion is to convene a work group to iron out the details to simplify future RFP language and policies. 
Motion by Ms. Patterson, second by Mr. Graves. Is there any opposition to this motion? Okay, seeing none. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, to the RFP review. And Mike, to you. You already did the RFP. <laughs> we're going to the accountability validation there piece, right? We're, right? we're going back to the agenda in, ah. in order, right? There we go. So you're yes. gonna click on down. And I'm not doing that because Julie's doing it. Okay, so now we have, a, and I believe I need a motion to approve the RFP. Yeah, Cherie. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve the RFP as amended. Second. Bob. Okay, the motion is to approve the RFP as amended by uh, Cherie Patterson, second by Bob Beal. Is there any objection to this motion? Okay. All right, now we can move on. Now we Mike, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a follow up to uh, the survey results that you all received in the February meeting, and they were attached here. Um, this issue was discussed at the Commercial Technical Committee Committee meeting in March. Uh, most of that discussion centered around the idea that the original survey was very intentionally somewhat broad because there is a lack of definition on uh, some of the language in there and specifically um, they referred to things like the words validation and audit. It, people are using them in very different ways and interpreting them in different ways and that was very clear in the answers that we got. Um, and so a small group was created to address the issue of um, accountability and they wanted to start out by determining, um, defining the terminology and then bringing that back to this group and looking for guidance on how the group felt we should move forward. Um, are there any questions on what the commercial technical group worked on in this topic? No questions? Okay. Moving right along. Uh, one back. And I have fresh news on this particular topic since I met this morning, this afternoon, with the NIMP CAO. Um, we've been asked to bring our systems into compliance with the Federal Information Security Management Act, or at least to have them reviewed um, with the eye towards the FISMA process. Um, we were given funds to pay for it um, through NIMPS. And we went ahead and hired an, uh, a company that specializes in this kind of work. And they went and they did an audit. And I will tell you, honestly, it was an exhaustive, long drawn out and fairly painful process um, that involved, what, two or three, four hour, five hour interview sessions and a lot of questions and a lot of poking. Um, we just um, last week received the draft, uh, the draft reply, uh, I'm sorry, the draft results of the audit. Um, and um, Along with that came a proposal from the contractor for $300,000 to do the monitoring for the following three years as long as well as writing the correction plans. Um, I politely refused their offer. Um, and uh, we went ahead and um, hired Joan Palmer to write our security plan. Uh, she's just retired from her position as Director of Information Systems at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center and had in fact just finished revising her own security plan. Um, our thinking was that um, Joan understands the internals of the NIMP systems, um, and she knows a lot more about us than the contractor would. Uh, and Joan was very eager to do it. And she's one of the few people I would say she actually said, this will be fun. Really, she did. I could, was stunned. So anyway, um, we met with the NIMP OCIO this morning. Um, and we had a chat, actually it was at one o'clock, about what their expectations are. ACCSP and the other fisheries information networks are in kind of a weird middle place. We are authorized under Magnuson-Stevenson, but we aren't actually federal systems. There's no legal obligation for us to comply with FISMA. On the other hand, if we don't, um, it will cause all kinds, of, um, all kinds of issues with information sharing, especially as uh, security requirements get tighter. Um, they are especially worried about personal identification information. So that's, you know, names, addresses, birth dates, that kind of thing. 
And as, as many of you have been familiar with our processes over the years, we pretty much have to have people's names and birth dates to be able to uniquely identify them inside our systems. Um, so we had a, a, an open conversation with them. Um, we are going to present them with the results of the audit. Um, and I know that Joan stayed behind and had a little bit more further discussion with them. I haven't had a chance to touch base with her yet. Uh, but but um, the next step here would be for them to come back to us and identify what in that report are the priorities. And most of the time, um, as they went through our, um, our planning and our, our implementations, it isn't that we haven't done the steps that need to be done. It's that they are not documented in accordance with the kinds of standards that the feds expect to see. So a lot of this will be generating paper that lines up, that lines up with the, the way that they think they need to see them. Um, and there shouldn't be much impact on our end users. Um, most of you, any of you who are familiar with our confidentiality process, that clearly meets a FISMA requirement, for example. Um, although the way we've documented it um, doesn't, quite, doesn't quite meet the standard. <laughs> um, so there are, there are a few other things that we're going to have to do from a technical standpoint. I won't glaze you all over about, about what, it, what they are. Um, but I think in the, in the near term, uh, we'll get a list of priorities back from the OCIO and we'll have uh, Joan and Ed, um, Ed on the staff who's also working with this, um, will be working on, is he here someplace? He's supposed to be here. Where are you, Ed? There you are, Ed. Uh, Joan and Ed are, are working, on, uh, working on writing the plans and uh, part of Ed's follow on duties will be to act as our security officer. It remains to be seen how much ongoing funding and, and resources are going to have to be put on maintaining this. FISMA isn't a one-shot deal. You get an audit, you identify your priorities, you fix them, you look at your next list of priorities, you fix them, you look at the third list of priorities, you fix them, you start over again. It's a three-year cycle where you have to provide quarterly updates to the OCIO about where you are and what's going on if they require us to follow the conventional NIMS standard. Um, I talked to them, I made it pretty clear that if they do that to us, we need to have some money from them to pay for it. They didn't seem to have any problem with that. <laughs> This coming from their HMS representative, um, so I was very pleased about very pleased about the level of support. They were very cooperative. They were very interested in helping us out. Um, they want to be active participants in our planning process. Um, so I felt pretty comfortable um, pretty comfortable walking out of that meeting. Again, I think that in the in the near term, um, you're not going to look at too much. Uh, there is, will be some changes likely in the not too distant future inside the commission. Those of you who access our database directly, there's probably going to be some tightening down of security. We're going to have to have uglier passwords. Um, there will have to be some kind of security training and sign-offs. Those sorts of things are, are what we're looking at. I am not looking to pass out cat cards to people so they can access our systems. So we're hoping uh, we'll know more as time, uh, as time goes by, um, but I am confident that, that um, Joan and Ed will, will make sure that we are minimally impacted while at the same time meeting the requirements that they've given us. Okay, next. Um, the safest redesign is uh, still underway, although we've, we've not been able to devote as much energy towards it as we wanted to, simply because we've focused so much work on getting the eTrips mobile tool up to snuff to be able to, to collect both northeast and southeast uh, for higher commercial and HMS requirements. Um, the, uh, and I'll talk to that in just a minute. We have created something that's going to be the heart of the new system. We're creating a switchboard that will essentially allow program partners to turn fields off and on and turn the way that they are validated off and on. So for example, if you want circle hooks, you click the little button that turns them on. If then they will suddenly appear in the folks that are reporting to you. Um, if you want, um, if, and I'm being hypothetical now, if you want to be able to report not only the dealer that you sold it to, but which doc you landed it on, you'll be able to do that. If you have to split, those kinds of things are going to be gradually built into this as part of the redesign of the system. So at the, the end, the end goal, and I'm not going to promise how long it's going to take, but the, at the end goal, you should be able to custom configure the system to meet your own requirements within the ACCSP standard. Um, we also um, are working on the TMS system, for those uh, just to recall, it is essentially the, the switchboard that, that, that moves the, moves the data um, to the other systems that need it or indicates that it needs to be moved. It also creates the universal trip ID, which is critical to integrated reporting. Um, so TMS, uh, we have a version of TMS, the baseline system is up and running, it 
really right now just consists of some database tables and a bunch of procedures. When a VTR hits the safest database, it's given a universal trip ID. So the next, the next thing that we're going to be looking at, and it's actually next week, is uh, pre-trip notifications, which are going to be required for the Southeast reporting, and eventually for Northeast, when the Mid-Atlantic requires all that commercial reporting, that is going to overlap into a whole bunch of folks that have to do pre-trip notifications. So we need to be ready to do that. Trip management will say, I have a pre-trip notification for a Northeast permitted dealer. It needs to go to the pre-trip notification system that's managed by the Northeast Fishery Science Center. That, in turn, would notify the observer system and the VTRs and, the, and law enforcement. So it will also maintain, the TMS system will also maintain a cross-reference of all the reports that are associated with that trip. So as the reports are added into, into SAFIS, if a dealer report that comes in off of a trip, then it will, then it will co connect them together and eventually resulting in the warehouse of a single record that represents all of the different pieces that we have that go with that trip. Over time, we hope that that will include the biological and observer data and potentially electronic monitoring as well. That's, that's like a decade kind of thing, but that's the vision. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, she say I'm talking too much. eTrips Mobile version two. Um, we released the latest version of eTrips Mobile on April 15th. They're working on 2.1 right this minute. It is much more flexible. It runs on both kinds of phones. It runs on all three kinds of tablets, and it will run on a Windows 10 desktop. Um, it includes some redesign work that we did. We're working on the hailout, which will include the HMS and social econ elements that are going to be required. Um, and 2.1 is in discussion right now, and that will be released fairly soon and have all that stuff in it. Next, please. You can't be referred to Thank you, Mike. Either. I'll be, I'll be super quick. This is kind of a announcement slash uh, pre-announcement. We've been working with MRIP on a national level for hire data collection methods workshop. So this is the idea of evaluating the minimum requirements of implementation challenges for for a future kind of comprehensive program. The idea is vessels that have a required mandatory logbook, how, what elements of when those reports come in, how do they get validated, what are the minimum requirements of, of those components, and how does that match up with the idea of if there are, for example, state vessels that don't have a logbook, how do those get included in the survey? So it's, it's uh, state waters, federal waters, uh, up and down the coast, national level, and headboats and, and charter boats. The audience is really national representatives. We've got about 40 people identified and committed to do this. We're going to be holding the workshop July 10th and 11th. Uh, many of your um, state and, and federal partner agency representatives are already aware of this. wanted to just at least highlight this and briefly, next slide, um, let you guys read what the major terms of reference are for that workshop. Uh, if you've got questions, please feel free to ask me afterwards, but we'll be, we'll be sending out a, a, a further notice later. A quick add on to that. This is really important to be able to use these recreational trip data for catch estimation later. We're really looking forward to the outcome of this. Very excited about it. Yeah. The intention is to figure out what are the minimum elements and pieces so that they can, MRIP can include the for hire logbooks for effort and catch and do the right math to combine it so that there's a single comparable estimate at a national level on the for hire statistics uh, that we both believe in statistically, statistically and uh, empirically. And emotionally. And emotionally, yes, <laughs> excellent. Next slide. It's me. I'll try to make it fast because I know we're under a time crunch. Um, just <laughs> wanted to give a quick update. On Pardon me one moment. Alex De Johnson, who has led the <laughs> Apis tablet development, I think you saw him at the last meeting, yes. but um, he's been, been in charge of the tablet development and, and Apis at the moment. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so just a quick update on Apis so far. Um, we're almost finished. Today's the last day. I think there's maybe 15 assignments left for um, wave two, so for March and April, and wave one is obviously finished with just, just North Carolina. Uh, and so far this has been done uh, in 2019. All of it's been done on tablets so far. Uh, we're looking at just under 1,400 site assignments completed, uh, and these are actually a little bit old, so it's probably, uh, I think it's closer to 50 headboat assignments completed at this point, um, with uh, just under, or just over 4,000 intercepts, and per assignment it's coming out to be about three intercepts per assignment. So far this about matches what we were seeing in previous years, uh, 18, 17, and 16, it's about the same 
And uh, we actually just had an assignment come through with 98 intercepts recently. Um, so people are still killing it out there with uh, their ability to get as many people as possible out there on, on assignment. Um, and the application uh, in general, the way that we're kind of doing this on the tablet, we have an application on there that we're developing. Um, it's pretty much finished at this point. There's still a couple minor things that are, that are being worked on, but overall the application software is where we want it to be to maximize the interviewer's time out there, uh, to have as many intercepts as possible, to improve the timeliness of, a, of available data. And we're seeing this reflected in the way that um, the data is QC'd, both between us and the states. Uh, it's a lot faster. It's the reduction in recall bias is, is great. I say they submitted something yesterday, and I say, hey, what, you know, what was this supposed to mean? They remember because they literally just did it yesterday. Um, and so far, yeah, uh, all the tablets have been sent out. Um, can't remember. It's, like, it's about 170 tablets, I think, throughout the coast? Uh, about 140. 140. 140 along the coast, and they're all distributed. Uh, they're all set up. I just actually worked with the last of them in Maine uh, right before coming here. So uh, everyone's ready to go for this year, and we actually held our first wave meeting with all the states uh, on um, the 17th of this month. So we're on target to keep going for APIS into 2019. Thank you, Alex. And passing it to Colby Wilt, who has been leading the charge on the Four Hires Telephone Survey data collection. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, with the Four Hire Telephone Survey, the ACCSP is developing what we call a CADI system, which is a computer assisted telephone interviewing system. Um, this is a centralized uh, web based tool where states would be able to go on and conduct MRIP's Four Hire Telephone Survey. Uh, with MRIP's approval, we've been creating this tool and have started implementing it and collecting data using the tool uh, in 2019. So uh, there are three states that are going to be using the tool or already using the tool in 2019, which is North Carolina, Georgia, and Maine. Uh, North Carolina started in wave one. Uh, Georgia started in wave two, so they're just finishing their first wave. Um, and Maine starts in wave three, which is next week. Um, so that's very, very soon. Uh, North Carolina um, uh, basically noted that their, the process is significantly more efficient, about 30% more efficient than the process that they were using before. Um, primarily because the CADI system uh, does a lot automatically for them um, that they used to have to do manually, uh, which, is, uh, which has been really useful for them. Um, they've had really high response rates so far through the survey this year. So in North Carolina, overall response rates in, in waves one and two were 83 percent, um, and Georgia has been 81 percent. Um, both of those are very good for a telephone survey. Um, in 2020, we'd be looking at um, the potential of expanding this to all states, Maine through Georgia, in 2020. And so um, the idea is, is that this would increase state contact um, and build relationships with the fishermen. North Carolina has noted this, where they actually have the same people interviewing for APIS as they have making calls per their region. Um, and because they already have a relationship with the captain, when they go out and they, they, um, they talk to them and then they give them a call, they know who it is and they're much more likely to respond. Um, that, that's part of the reason why they've had such a good response rate so far. Um, and let's see. Uh, they can have more direct vessel directory changes. Um, so it actually gives them a lot of... Um, it gives them a lot of control over the actual vessel directory. And so if they're conducting the four-hire telephone survey, they're the only person that's actually going to be uh, the only entity that's going to be making corrections and updates within that system. And then lastly, to Jeff's point that he was talking about before with the comprehensive four-hire, once we move forward with that, uh, using the system will allow the states um, a lot more flexibility in moving forward with four-hire logbooks for each state. And then, Julie, you're doing the commercial update? No, Heather is. Okay, Heather. Um, hi, Heather Connell, Senior Fisheries Data Coordinator with ACCSP. Um, so the 2018 commercial data are now available. We did a public release on April 16th, and we did a soft release on the 10th. Um, these data included uh, about 3 million records from 31 data sources. <clears throat> this is an earlier deadline than ever before, and a lot of that has to do with our partner collaboration. Uh, we did our spring data coordination calls, and that was during the federal government shutdown. And I was able to even get um, federal feedback during those calls, so that was great. 
Um, also, it has a lot to do with the staff effort um, to improve and automate processing and quality checks. Um, for these data, we've gotten really positive feedback from our partners. Um, and this release also includes the third round of standardizing species common names um, with the fourth round underway. It should be released in about two weeks. Great. Thank you all for um, presenting what is an impressive amount of work. Once again, does anybody have any questions for anybody? John. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question about the For Hire telephone survey. Um, two questions, really. One is, are we going to get to the point where the captains don't have to do logbooks and get called? And two, where it said, you're expecting all states to take this over at the last meeting. I don't think we were the only state that was not real enthusiastic about taking this, this on ourselves. And the option of having ACCSP do the survey for the state was presented at that time. And that's still the plan. So there's, there's, no, there's no expectation that says, yes, you will. Um, one way or the other, it will be accomplished. And, and to your first question, uh, we've been working and, and having, having some discussions with the folks at EMRIP. Since we should have all the VTRs, we should be able to tell which captains are reporting. And eventually, we're, work, we're working with them to develop a methodology to exempt them from calls. Anybody else? OK, so I am going to take a very short moment here to um, reflect. And as we have just heard about this work um, that's ongoing and impressive, I want to make everybody aware, if you're not, that this will be Mike's last meeting as director. He is retiring. And I want to just extend um, a heartfelt thank you for all of your exceptional work. This is very difficult, complicated stuff that you work with. And you have um, done it well. And um, thank you so much. We're going to miss you. Can I say just a couple things? Before you, before you adjourn, thank you. First of all, so long and thanks for all the fish. I hope most of you get the reference. Um, wow, it's been an amazing, amazing ride. I've been working with a lot of you guys from the very first. Um, I can look at like Cherie and actually even Jeff and others around the table that I've been working, at, working with from the very, very get-go when it was just me and Joe Moran. Um, God, 20 years ago. And we had, uh, we had a computer that I actually built that was sitting in my office that was our first data warehouse. I could not have asked for a better opportunity. I could not have asked for better people to work with or a better mission. Um, I take away from this a deep and abiding respect for the work and dedication that you all have that made what we have done possible. Um, I really, uh, I could not have asked for a better blessing and I want to thank you all for your support over the years. And I will miss you all. Thank you. And with that, would anybody object to adjourning? Okay. <laughs>